This is a Renegade Media Network podcast. Finally, the best time of the year has arrived. That would be football season. Don't roll your eyes. You got to quit focusing on the day in and day out craziness that we all focus on. Let your mind relax a little bit. If you love playing fantasy football, but struggle to find maybe, I don't know, the right resource to help you with your research, maybe keep losing every season, well, I've got you covered. And by that, I mean my sponsors over at Football Insider Edge have you covered. Whether you're a season-long player focused on DraftKings or maybe FanDuel-type contests, or if you just like to make the occasional wager each week on a couple of games, make a couple of dollars, the guys at Football Insider Edge provide you with the research tools and the in-depth analysis to take your game to the next level with their proprietary model matchup charts and industry award-winning content the team at football insider edge have devoted themselves to educating their subscribers how about that helping them improve their play and in a few special moments which i would like to arrive at one of these moments winning life changing money they are proud of the community they've built through weekly interaction on their slack chat channel and take great pride in helping others to achieve their goals of becoming better fantasy players. Check this out. As supporters of this show, which they are, and I guess you could say the Liberty Movement as a whole, these guys are that, they are currently offering a 20% discount on any monthly or full season plan on their website. So, of course, to get that 20% off, you need to type in counterflow. That is your promo code that I'm giving you guys to get this 20% off over at footballinsideredge.com. Once again, footballinsideredge.com, promo code counterflow. Do it at checkout. Take advantage of the discount offer today. Let's get to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back once again to another episode of the Counterflow Podcast. One of my favorite people to talk to, no matter what the situation may be, is our guest today. And I know he's one of your favorite people to hear on podcasts, specifically this one, because I always see the numbers bump up when I get the president of the Mises Institute on here, Jeff Deist. So I reached out to Jeff because... He recently gave a speech, a talk in Colorado for a Mises Institute event up there, and it was called the COVID Silver Lining. And I think at this moment in time, with all the craziness surrounding us, and we get into this bit in the interview, we're, it still feels like maybe we're in a fog of war here, but silver linings, it helps. It helps to maybe refocus things and get a nice perspective on where things are at. Not everything happening is bad. You can always find some silver linings in it. And so we're going to do that. We're going to discuss the COVID moment 2020 and the positives that we can take from that. And Jeff gave a very good talk. I'll link to it in the show notes page for this episode. And we're going to get into what good has come out of this. What do you guys think it is? I just it seems obvious to me because I don't want to give anything away, but let's just say part of the silver lining is something I actually took part in myself over 2020. And then we get into some strategy talk. What can be done? What must be done as far as maybe fixing things? Can't really do it at a federal level, it seems these days. Is a state level good? What about a local level in small towns? Can some change be made at that level? And we get into that as well. We uh, reference the wonderful Hans Hermann Hoppe essay, What Must Be Done. And it was actually, I say essay, it was a speech that he gave at the Mises Institute in 1997. And it's been transcribed, of course, into a small little mini book type deal. And I'll link to that as well in the show notes page. So we're going to get into all of that. I should tell you, this is the very first time now, you guys know that I've been featuring all of these podcasts on the YouTube page where you can watch the video of the interview. This is the first time I've had Jeff on when that's been the case. The other times it was just 
all audio. So I know there are some listeners out there that will want to view this interview. You know who you are. So it's on our YouTube page, Counterflow with Buck Johnson, and subscribe to it. I'm trying to get those numbers up. You've heard me say it before, but I ignored that page for far too long, and now I'm trying to put some love into it and give you guys some some great content on there besides just the audio feed that you get here. And, and that would be stuff like, well, live streams that I will be doing strictly, solely on the YouTube page. So subscribe to that page and uh, give us some love and help me get those numbers up and all of that good stuff. Let's just get right to the president himself. Jeff Deist is president of the Mises Institute, where he serves as a writer, public speaker, and advocate for property, markets, and civil society. He previously worked as a longtime advisor and chief of staff to Congressman Ron Paul, for whom he wrote hundreds of articles and speeches. In his years with Dr. Paul, he worked with countless grassroots activists and organizations dedicated to reducing the size and scope of government. He spent many years as a tax attorney, advising private equity clients on mergers and acquisitions. He's here on Counterflow, my friend, one of my favorite guests to get on the show, President Jeff Deist. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? Hey, Buck. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, my audience doesn't know, but we were just talking prior to this, and you're already fired up. So uh, <laughs> that's how we fired up Jeff Deist is good Jeff Deist. Well, I try. I try to keep it under wraps. How are things at the Mises Institute before we get into this? How are things down there? Well, it's good. We have a, a full slate of events. You know, it's a very strange year. We're seeing a lot of uh, really bizarre takes on the economy, on the Fed, on inflation, on COVID. And, uh, you know, trying to push back on that as, as best we can. And, uh, you know, obviously really disappointing in the libertarian sphere to see so much rollover to all this. And uh, I saw one... Uh, won't name him, libertarian economist the other day saying, well, you know, uh, GDP seems to have come back and uh, there's more people unemployed, but it doesn't really seem to matter, ho, ho, ho. And, you know, you're just thinking to yourself, you know, do you really believe that shutting down production maybe of half the country for 18 months, did, you know, having fewer goods and services as a result is, is not a big deal because of a useless aggregate like GDP, which includes government spending and the $2.9 trillion CARES Act, by the way. So, you know, it's this kind of navel-gazing stuff, this uh, clever masquerading as smart uh, mm -hmm. that has really soiled the libertarian sphere with the COVID business. Yeah, you gave a talk that I want to get into when you were in Colorado recently called Silver Linings of the COVID Moment, uh, something thereabouts. And something you mentioned in it that I, I still think a lot of us find ourselves in is the fog of war and, and kind of trying to grasp what actually happened, what we're doing right now, and what could be happening in the future. Uh, a lot of us are still in the fog of war. I, what are some of your clear takeaways from 2020? Well, that, that uh, government at all levels wildly overreacted to a very survivable virus uh, that we would probably, I can't say this definitively, but that we would probably be better off if we had literally done nothing and just let the virus virus and uh, achieve some sort of herd immunity. I can't say that again definitively, but I suspect that's the case. I know that we'd be better off if we had taken steps uh, to isolate and protect older people especially and people with immunocompromised conditions and basically let the rest of the world go about their business. Uh, there's no question we'd be better off with that. Um, but, you know, when I say the fog of war, we're, we're still in this sort of period like we were after 9-11, where, you know, who did it and what are the ramifications and how serious is it? But now we're 18 months later and we're still asking so many of the same questions are unanswered. You know, we still don't have good, clear answers on, you know, how many vaccines do you need? Is it three? Is it four? We still don't have real, in my opinion, we still don't have real clarity on masks. You know, maybe they have a slight effect on transmission, a 10 or 15% effect, but they have huge costs, which nobody ever talks about. People talk about the upsides of masks. They never talk about the downsides, which includes uh, bad psychology. They include terrible ramifications for child development, especially infant development, looking up at your mommy in a mask. Imagine that. 
Uh, and they also have, I, I think, some respiratory questions, which we haven't answered yet, having this filthy uh, cloth where you're trying to exhale uh, CO2 all day is probably not very good for you. So it's going to be some time till we really have you know, clarity on that. But it's just interesting that uh, we still don't have really strong answers on masks. We really don't have strong answers on whether there are there's asymptomatic spread. I mean, you think this mm-hmm. would be a pretty important thing to figure out because if you don't spread it asymptomatically, then all you have to have to have you know a stadium full of 100,000 people is some kind of um, thermometer check at the gate or whatever. But of course, we don't want to look at that because politicians want to boss everybody around. And, uh, you know, all the way down to the local level, which we've seen over the last year. And, you know, there's an awful lot of people in this country who are hoping, praying for some kind of huge reset. And they got it. You know, they were willing in part, not entirely, but in part, they were willing to shut down the world to get Trump. Mm-hmm. As I think I've mentioned to you before, and that worked. They got Trump, and uh, now they want to keep it going. Something else that you just uh, kind of hinted at, and we've talked about this before, it it really hits home. Imagine had this whole thing happened, let's say in the 70s or the 80s or anything pre-internet, really. Uh, I think it was you that said it might have been a blurb, a few sections, a few pages into the first section of the New York Times, you know, some people get sick, some hospitals got full. You can't work from home. You can't lock anything down. They almost would have had to do nothing. Yeah, you can go back and find news stories as recently as 2017, 2018. But of course, if you go back decades of uh, certain hospital uh, ERs being overrun by a particularly bad flu in a particular area. So that's nothing new. Uh, you know, COVID appears to be a pretty nasty virus, and it's got some maybe some uh, endurance and some staying power that uh, traditional or standard cold viruses haven't had. But okay, I mean, you know, why wasn't anyone talking about diet and exercise and sunlight and mental health and isolation and obesity and drinking too much and all these things that really could have made people's lives better instead of just bossing them around to go home and don't work? get enhanced unemployment benefits, don't pay your rent. I mean, the whole thing is so obviously screwed. Uh, you know, it's clearly one of the worst things that our governments at all levels have, have ever done. I mean, this is a probably a once in a century screw up. At least I hope it's a once in a century yeah. screw up. Yeah, that's what we hope. What are, well, the talk you gave was on the silver lining, at least one lining, maybe if not more, of the COVID moment. And we'll get into the weeds of that. What What's the general takeaway uh, on what the silver lining from what we have been going through would be? Well, I think the biggest takeaway is localism. You know, everybody found out that all crises are local. No matter who you are, even if you're the wealthiest person on earth, you have to be somewhere physically. And wherever you are, you need to consume calories, you need hot and cold running water, you need electricity, you might need prescription drugs, you might need ingress and egress. Um, So, you know, nobody was totally untouched by COVID. And it made people realize that the conditions around you are actually very important because a lot of people, myself included, are guilty of, of really, you know, first of all, I travel a lot. And second of all, uh, it's easy to sort of live your day in this digital world. And that gets into your headspace. And you start to forget about, you know, your local environment. And, um, you know, you, you have, when was the last time you were in your backyard? When was the last time you really looked at the weeds in your garden or whatever it might be? Uh, and so uh, COVID and the shutdown sort of slammed the brakes on a lot of people's lifestyles. And I think that was, uh, al- although, you know, re- obviously based on a, on, on, on a crazy policies, uh, it, it probably made some people think. And when you start to think about localism more, you start to say, hey, you know, it really does matter if you're in Florida right now versus if you're in Australia right now. I mean, even, even today, much less March of last year, but even today in the fall, what is it now, September 1st of yeah. 2021, you know, it matters a lot if you're in Florida or if you're in Australia. It matters a lot if you're in Sweden versus the UK. I mean, uh, these differences uh, w- were really pretty profound. And I think once you get people thinking that way, it's very, very healthy because I think a lot of faith has been lost in institutions 
uh, you know, certainly over the past 10 years, but it's accelerated with Trump and all these other things and, and COVID now in Afghanistan, my God. Uh, and, and the biggest institution in America, whether we like it or not, far and away is Uncle Sam, the federal government. And so I think this is a really healthy thing that we're losing faith in the federal government's ability to manage anything. It can't manage COVID. It can't manage Afghanistan, for God's sake. It, it can't manage the dollar. It can't manage entitlements. Uh, it can't manage education. It can't manage medicine. So these are all healthy realizations because, you know, we know they're true. And so the sooner more people agree with us that they're true, I think the better, because we ought to be getting on with it. And um, we've, we've seen this, Buck, this incredible, beautiful, soft secession happening. You know, people are fleeing certain states and they're heading to other states in droves. I don't have to tell you this as a former Austinite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is, you know, it's not, it doesn't have, even have to be ideological necessarily. They're just fleeing dysfunction. And if, if we look at the political map, precinct by precinct, you know, red versus blue of, let's say, the last four or five presidential elections, if there is a shift of headcount away from cities, deep blue cities, and towards exurbs and rural areas, I mean, that, that represents a dramatic shift, a realignment of political power. I mean, that, that means the Electoral College is going to come roaring back into importance. I mean, all kinds of things. And, you know, I'm not a big believer in the GOP, but, I mean, the left is so bad uh, that they have to be stopped. I, I, don't, I don't think the GOP is necessarily a way to do that. I think this is more of a cultural issue than anything else. But, um, you know, this realignment, this, uh, you know, moving power, political, economic, social away from cities and towards more rural settings, that's huge. I mean, that hasn't happened in America ever, basically. I mean, the story of America is coming from uh, colonies to farms to industrial cities to um, technocratic cities, you know, where, where people used to move from the farm to Detroit uh, to work in a, you know, an auto plant or to Pittsburgh to work in a steel mill. Now they move to Seattle or Silicon Valley or New York to work at a tech company or a, a Wall Street finance company. So if that changes, if we've, if we've started to see a reversal of that, I think that has huge and bad ramifications for the left. Why did Zipix Toothpicks choose this podcast to start with before any of the other ones in their advertising? Well, it's because I reached out to them because I love this product. I was already using them, so why not help sell them and in turn make a little money for the Counterflow podcast? Zipix Nicotine Toothpicks. Let me tell you about them. Remember the toothpicks you would have when you were young with the cinnamon flavor? These are basically the adult version of that. They've got nicotine in each toothpick. And like I just mentioned, they actually have that cinnamon flavor along with mocha flavor. Peppermint watermelon is very good. And I really love the Spice Island Clove flavor. And so if you're trying to kick the nasty habit you may have or the stupid looking vape habit that you may have, this is the best and cheapest alternative. Not only cheapest, but think of it this way when you need that nicotine fix and you're on an airplane because everyone's flying again now, right? Or you're at a restaurant because now restaurants are open again. You don't have to wait until you get to your destination. If you're on vacation, you don't have to get up rudely and leave the table. If you're at a dinner, they're toothpicks. You can have them anywhere. No one cares. And like I said, if it's after dinner, you can actually use the toothpick function of it as well. So go to zippixtoothpicks.com and enter promo code counterflow for 20% off. Once again, zippixtoothpicks.com, promo code counterflow. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, and something that's uh, my wife and I try to wrestle with, and, and I just can't figure it out yet, uh, who's coming here? And even to our little town from crappy, shitty, blue Austin, who's coming to this red little town? Uh, for instance, Today in, in Texas, a few laws changed, and one one of them being concealed carry is is now a thing, and in the abortion laws changed, and excuse me, a concealed carry I believe without a license is is what it was, and the abortion laws were tightened a bit, and there's a lot of internet outrage from le the left on on how horrible Texas is now. There was a hashtag something like Texas uh, uh, Taliban and things like that, yet. 
everyone's fleeing here. They're fleeing from blue states to here. And I guess my, <laughs> my large worry is that it's people that maybe don't realize why they left a blue state and they're, and they're, mm. and they think that, that their politics weren't part of that and that they could bring the politics here and make them make this a better place. Or, uh, for instance, I'm, sh I'm certain there's people that move to my little town that think, oh, it's full of rednecks and, and we can change that. And, uh, my, my wife and I went to a very small town, even <laughs> much smaller than this to a, uh, an old honky tonk bar full of normal, nice people that just sat and chatted with us. And when she reported this to an Austinite friend, the friend said, oh, that's such a cool place, but there's so many Trump voters there. It must be terrible. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still trying to figure out who's moving to Texas. It's like a step-by-step -step process. They'll leave New York or California, move to Austin, because they think, well, we can deal with that. And then that gets bad. And then they move out of Austin. Do you have any sense as to, is it the bad blue state people moving to places like mine and possibly yours? Or are the, the people with common sense that say, this Gavin Newsom's created a hellhole here and I've got to get out of it? Yeah, it's hard to say. Um, it's interesting. You bring up the term redneck. That's the one slur that's still acceptable in American society today. It's actually encouraged, of course, um, against a group. Uh, you know, I think what you're going to see here is whether or not all these, especially tech companies moving people and facilities and headquarters to Austin, especially, are going to flex their muscle uh, over this abortion bill. You have a very weak governor, as yes. you know. And, um, you know, if they start saying, uh, you know, like Delta flexed its muscle in the state of Georgia, where it's a huge employer over a voting rights bill. Uh, or uh, or a voting ID bill or whatever it was. Um, maybe some of these tech companies will try to do the same. But, you know, it's the situation's a little different because uh, you moved to Texas pretty recently and you presumably moved there because you thought it was a better climate uh, economically or whatever for your workers to buy houses and all that. So, um, you know, it's it, it'll be interesting. So far, it, it doesn't look like Texas has gotten bluer uh, if we look at the 2020 election versus the 2016 or the 2012, at least at the statewide level, um, I'm sure it's gotten bluer in areas. I know Tarrant County has gotten awfully blue where Dallas is. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, Austin has always been super blue. Houston's very blue now. Um, so I, I think the, the bottom line for Texas is it was headed blue. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this new... Uh, realignment that's happening across America with a bunch of people moving from Texas, it, it might help thwart that. And if it doesn't, I think then, you know, y your fate was that way anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe that would be the silver lining then. You often talk about, and I've stolen this idea from you, I believe you got it from Steve Bannon, but post-persuasion America, and I, I gave a chat up in Oregon, a uh, talk about that kind of thing. Do you Do you think generally we are past persuading folks with facts, charts, logic, reason, because a lot of people in our circles do like to rely on logic mm -hmm. and reason. Do you think we're past that generally? Well, I don't think we're past it. There's always new young people coming up and there's, there's even people who in middle age or old age have a, uh, you know, an awakening and change their, their worldview or their politics. I mean, that happens, but the question you have to ask yourself is what's the most efficient use of time and energy and resources? And on that sense, I mean, maybe I'm jaded because I'm, you know, spend time on Twitter. Maybe that gives me a, uh, you know, a distorted view of the left. But from what I can tell, uh, the, you know, the chasms between some people, and we even see it on vaccines, sure feel like they're too wide to, to bridge anymore. And so the question becomes, is trying to bridge that chasm the, the wisest use of your time and energy or is trying to, to, to unyoke yourself politically a wiser thing? I mean, you left Austin. In a sense, that was your own, uh, you know, action of mini secession. And you did that because you thought it would better your life or your circumstances probably on, a, on, on multiple levels. And so you multiply that by millions and millions of people and... Um, I think you get 
you know, you get an obvious answer staring you in the face, which is that if, if we're all at each other's throats, why don't we just make it so that people who don't live in Texas don't have to worry about Texas abortion laws? I mean, that right. strikes me as the sensible approach and that people can leave Texas if they do uh, disagree with Texas abortion laws. But instead, um, we have this one size fits all uh, mania. And there's a, an economist who writes for Bloomberg named Noah Smith. He, he had a Twitter thread, I guess it was today, maybe yesterday, about how, well, you know, we're not going to break up as a nation. And finally, we're, you know, here's what we have to do to get these, these uh, deplorables in these red states to, uh, you know, come out of the Neanderthal period. And so it was obviously a, a, a thread full of condescension. But what... Mm-hmm. But what was more striking than the condescension was that there, you know, I, it was that you know this isn't Hoppe saying that we need to let these people go. You know, it, it was quite the opposite. It was clear that he doesn't intend uh, to allow anyone to be unyoked from his polit- preferred political program. And so, um, you know, I think that's what we ought to be talking about avoiding. And uh, I mean, if you look at Florida, you look at the growth there. You look at Texas. You look at. Uh, you know, uh, Montana, Idaho is booming. Mm-hmm. Arizona is booming. Tennessee is booming. Uh, there, there's a real opportunity here for a realignment. And I, you know, I don't want to vanquish the left. I, uh, that, you know, I, I, I wish the left well. I, you know, I don't think big government works. I don't think uh, the whole panoply of left egalitarian woke policies work. Uh, I don't think banning guns and having, you know, abortion up to the last day and having open borders, I don't think those things work. I don't think those things are right. But, I, you know, I, if if that's what other states want to enact for themselves, I absolutely would accord them that freedom. You said uh, in, in that talk in Colorado, something that really stuck with me, and that's uh, the COVID moment unveiled at least two big mindsets in the country one of those is the side that truly wants businesses locked down and likes seeing these cops in the street beat down lockdown pro- protesters and vax mandate protesters. And you kind of summed it up in a tweet you just referenced uh, this morning. And that is uh, the modern progressive mindset. You referred to it as a warped ideology of vengeance. And I, I keep seeing the same thing. And often, even in libertarian circles, I can always identify someone who's basically a progressive because they come off as it, it seems that their their thoughts and their philosophies rooted in resentment and smugness. And I'm still trying to figure out why that is, where that comes from. I, I guess I'm making more of a statement than a question, but I'd like to get your thoughts on that because it baffles me. Um, I've I've got a book recently by a psychologist that delves into this, and I'm going to get him on at some point here. But I assume you see that. And why do you think that is? Yeah, it's such a tough question because both sides sort of feel like the other side started it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there is this smugness and contempt and you feel it. You feel it uh, in, in libertarian circles, but certainly in progressive circles, uh, this just, just hatred for rural and especially Southern America. Mm-hmm. And that's not a healthy outlook. That's not a liberal outlook. I mean, I've, I've lived in deepest blue America and I've lived in, in what I guess most blue people would think is deep red, uh, America in Alabama. And, you know, I mean, there, there's no reason that you can't have in a country this big with a population this size that you can't have all kinds of diversity and variety. The, the problem, the, the violence, uh, this, this idea of vengeance comes in when we have a, a mechanism for harming each other through Washington, D.C., through the federalization of everything. That's that's what concerns me. And when you talk about these things, unfortunately, it's almost like uh, Reagan Gorbachev or something like you have to have a detente because, you know, both sides are distrustful of the other. Both sides think the other is probably winning. And, yeah. um, you know, when you think that, you think, well, why should I, you know, why should I give a, why should I yield an inch? To these people, we just need we need to defeat them rather than walk away from them, and you know that's a, that would be a pyrrhic victory even if it could be obtained. And I think if you're liberty minded, uh, you're even more of a minority than anybody on the the you know woke progressive left or the you know let's say Christian right. You're you're way more of a minority than than either one of those groups. So the, the you know universalism 
is uh, is the downfall, I think, of uh, of ideology because this idea that you have to have impose your way on everybody else and that you know basically the social democracies of the United States or Western Europe are are it. That's the blueprint. That's the model. The whole world has to kneel to. Um, we're kind of doing that at the at the state level here in the U.S. You know, in, D.C. is an imperial power amongst the 50 states, and it bosses us around just as much as it's an imperial power with respect to Afghanistan or anybody, anyplace else. And we, we ought to view it that way. And it, it just it strikes me that progressives could could have so much of what they want right here, right now, mm-hmm. if they were just willing to let go of some of that power and authority over the red states. I mean, they could really if we just had a more aggressive degree of federalism in this country, they could have, you know, the whole panoply panoply of progressive wish list, they could have that right now in, in New York, in, in California, in Oregon, in Washington state. And, and, you know, they choose not to because they, they just want to fight it out and federalize everything. Hans Hermann Hoppe had a, a wonderful speech and it's, it's been printed now in articles and whatnot in a mini book, I believe, uh, called what must be done and I think it's from 1997, but I, I find when I listen to it, it's still, I, I mean, he was very prescient. I, obviously, he still is quite brilliant. And I, I really like some of the ideas in that. Uh, it's a lot of stuff. A, a lot of ANCAPs and libertarians don't even think in terms of, I bet Hans Hermann Hoppe would be willing to work through the electoral system at a local level or, you know, because that seems, oh my God, that's taboo. That's that's force and whatnot. But can you talk about kind of summarize what the gist of of what Hans Hermann Hoppe was getting at with with his speech what must be done and how we we can actually well, use some of that? Yeah, it's it's interesting because Rothbard wrote a bunch of strategy memos yeah. over the years. I mean, he has four or five of them which are really enduring and you go back and read them and you go, "Wow, you know, it it feels like all those same uh forces or themes are still in effect today." And so when Hoppe gave his speech, it was actually a talk at a Mises Institute event in 1997. He laid out, you know, this sort of formula or blueprint for advancing our cause. And when I went back and read it recently, I was blown away by how much of that seemed prescient, as you say, and how much of it seemed just absolutely on point and relevant today. So he goes through, you know, basically a big discussion of how uh, n- national elites uh, certainly governmental elites are actually a pretty tiny uh, fraction of, the, of any population. And so their whole standing is based on this sort of popular will and and this sort of popular support uh, that grants them legitimacy and credibility. So he says, if you undermine that, that's actually a bottom-up approach. And it's it's it needs to start at the local level where you sort of identify people who are natural leaders and that you go from there and that it's, it's actually very hard if you think about it for maybe 3 million federales to, to come run America. And if some, uh, you know, uh, Angelo Cotavilla has written about this as well. He wrote a, a, uh, a, an excellent essay in the Claremont review, uh, about, you know, America divided. Mm-hmm. And he says, you know, what, what could they really do if some, small town in Texas at its local high school government, you know, taxpayer funded high school, uh, wants to have prayer before it games. You know, we all pray that some, no kids get a concussion or something, <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, are they going to send in the troops and Hoppe questions this and, and he really strikes at this idea of legitimacy. And so, you know, we, we have to be, I think, realistic. We have to be shrewd. And I think we have to understand that there are, there are tens of millions of people in America who deeply vociferously disagree with us, who believe in the state as a, as a, basically as a religion and in, in politics and politicians as clergy. And so rather than trying to win them over in a national election, I mean, who you're going to have your person's going to become president. Um, I, I really like the hopping approach. I think it's fascinating and I, I'm happy to, uh, to get that link for anybody who's interested. Yeah, I, I will link to it for sure in the show notes page for this episode. It talks about things that might sound, I don't know, they will ruffle some feathers, I suppose. Uh, something like local public servants not being able to uh, vote on tax hikes, tax cuts. I actually totally agree with that. Even before I read this, uh, 
you and my listeners probably know, I am a firefighter for a city which I will not say the name of, but I've often said I should not vote in, in that city's election. I should not be able to as far as people that are promising to give the fire department more money or to raise taxes on anything like that. I shouldn't do it because it's a conflict of interest. What are your thoughts on that, Jeff? Well, we have examples of this in federal and state law. For example, um, there are public sector unions which are not allowed to strike mm -hmm. because That's they are right. considered, um, you know, they're, 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 they're going on strike is considered a risk to, uh, you know, public safety or public health. So we have I examples of this where if you work for the government, um, you know, certain rights are diminished. We, we also have, unfortunately, uh, the flip side of that, whereas if you work for the government, certain rights are enhanced, like qualified immunity sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the idea that uh, direct tax consumers in the form of government employees, state employees, shouldn't vote, I don't think that's radical in the slightest. I think that's right on. Another thing, I, and I, I'm asking you some of this because I am actually considering uh, here in Lockhart at some point running for a local office. And I, you know, I got to brainstorm on what ideas will sink me and <laughs> what ideas may not. The ideas of property owners being the only ones to be able to vote on property tax. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that would make a lot of people howl. Um, yeah. Obviously, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we, we've seen if you're a property owner and you're a landlord, you've seen in the last year and a half what the federal government thinks of your property rights Yeah. with this CDC rent moratorium. Um, and here's the thing is people don't want to hear this, but liberalism is rooted in property. If you go back and read Mises' great book, Liberalism, which is really to me a blueprint, that along with nation, state, and economy, which were written both in the interwar years within 10 years of each other. I think those two books, and they're both pretty short, those two books are the greatest blueprint uh, for, you know, just a reasonable, free, happy, prosperous society that any, that any uh, bureaucrat or politician could ever read. And they're both radically decentralist. Uh, I think both those books are a little bit misunderstood. Uh, that, you know, that, you know, Mises was talking about a liberal nationalism. Now that, you know, and, and most of your left liberals today would say, well, that's a a contradiction, an oxymoron, but he, he cared very much about natural, natural identities. He, he was very concerned about political minorities and libertarians ought to start to think of themselves a little bit more as political minorities, by the way. Um, he, he cared a lot about linguistic or ethnic, uh, or, uh, you know, any kind of minority in society and, and political minorities. He cared a lot about political minorities. He said, you know, when you have these wars and you have these conquests, you end up with these kind of, um, uh, you know, newly drawn maps of what constitutes a nation. And we, we've seen that with Iraq, for example. We've seen that in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, oftentimes it pits different groups against each other politically because there's a national government. And so the minority group is, is forever being imposed upon. And I think that, that, you know, those are really important things to consider. There's actually a line in liberalism where, where Mises says, if I, could, uh, if I could, you know, distill the entire liberal program down to a single word, it would be property. And so from that flows so much of what we know, you know, it's pr property itself flows from self-ownership. Uh, so th this idea that property or mere, mere property or mere economic concerns or economic rights are not nearly as important as individual or personal rights. That's actually, uh, you know, wrong. The, the, the truth is that those two things are inseparable. And, um, you know, you might find that, uh, a, you know, a significant minority, I'm not going to say a majority, but you might find that a pretty significant minority agreed with you if you ran on a platform among, among other things of only letting uh, property owners vote on property taxes. You might find, you might find that you have more support than you think. Let me tell you guys about your one-stop shop for all things CBD related, and that would be PalomaVerdeCBD.com. That is PalomaVerdeCBD.com, where naturally they are a sponsor of this show. 
So there's a promo code, which is BUCK, B-U-C-K. If you use that over at PalomaVerdeCBD.com, you will get 25% off of your order. Everything over $75, that is. So that's the stuff I got to tell you up top. Now, I want to tell you, other than supporting this show, which I'm assuming you'd like to do, I'll tell you some other reasons why you should shop there. For one, they opened a brick and mortar store right before the government lockdowns happened, which basically wiped that part out. So they're online only now. So you got to feel for anyone that was a victim of government overreach, like the lockdowns. And that's what these guys were. But they're a really wonderful couple. They're very good people, very like minded into this kind of same stuff, the weird stuff that we're all into. I can tell you that Carlos and Vanessa out of San Antonio are truly good people and they're really hard workers. They put a lot into this business. There's a lot of personal touches. So that ought to uh, entice you guys as well. I can tell you about some of the products. They've got the mint CBD tinctures. They've got all the CBD stuff. If you're thinking, do they have this? Yeah, they probably do. They've got CBD soft gels, CBD gummies. They've got the tinctures. Like I said, they've got salve stick. There's a sleep bundle to help you sleep with several things in that. They've got salve and I bragged about this a lot, but I genuinely mean it. The CBD cool menthol sports cream is the best sports cream I've ever used. And I am not saying that just because they're sponsors. I actually mean it. Also the pet treats, the dog chews. Guess who loves the dog chews? That would be Lux, my French bulldog. If you know anything about the French Bulldog breed, once they're about 10 years old, they kind of limp around a little bit slower than they used to. Well, that was my dog, basically, up until I started giving him these dog chews and putting the uh, pet CBD tinctures on his food every morning. And now he thinks he's like two years old again, which would be 14 years old, I guess, in dog years. But yeah, so he thinks he's a teenager. Anyway, I love that he loves that. And I love that these guys are sponsors. Like I said, they're great people. They want to help support this show, as do you. So, PalomaVerdeCBD.com, promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K at checkout, gets you 25% off of everything over $75. Please give them a visit. It helps them, it helps me, and it helps my dog. What more could you ask for? Let's get back to the show. Yeah, we, we, we might be able to see that at some point here in the near future. Uh, let's talk about second, third, fourth order effects from the COVID moment, from the lockdowns. Do you have any insight on stuff we might be seeing here in the near future or maybe in a few years down the road? I, I think a lot of people, especially the ones that were pro-lockdown, haven't even considered second, third order effects. But Yeah, what are your, well, what are your... the health stuff, you know, that's... I'll leave that to someone in the field, but I mean, we know that there's people got fatter, they drank more, there were fewer cancer screenings, uh, little kids had a very rough time psychologically at home or at school, Uh, young adults, 18, 20, 22, had a failure to launch on time. Um, So we know that all of those things, uh, the the social isolation, the psychological damage, those will all have ripple effects for years and years and years. I mean, that's almost incalculable. Uh, Now, what's a little closer to home for me is the economic effects of when you shut down half the world or half the production for a year and a half or a year, whatever it is, uh, that's, you know, hugely deflationary first and foremost. But then on the other side, you have both fiscal and monetary policy just gone completely insane, uh, trying to do anything possible to offset that deflation and create inflation. So you have these two twin but opposing forces at work. It's, um, you know, it's, it's clear that they're going to make sure the inflationary side wins. So I think you're going to see over the next decade that, it, that price inflation, consumer price inflation, not just asset inflation, is not going to be nearly as contained as it was in the decades of the 2010s. Now, in the 2010s, after the crisis of 08, you know, they, they managed to mostly contain uh, inflation to assets, to equities and housing and, uh, and other type, you know, commod- some commodities, certain assets. But this time around, I think we're already seeing that it's going to go more into prices because I think the assets have already been bid up so much. So I think that's going to be one uh, dramatic effect. I think the other is that, you know, people forget about this, but a lot of people didn't have income or didn't save money or didn't do the usual things they do for a year or a year and a half. And, um, you know, 
if that happens when you're 25, that has ramifications uh, in terms of your net worth when you're 80, mm-hmm. right? That, that and Mark Spitznagel talks about that very thing in his new book, which is called Safe Haven. Um, so you're going to see the economic effects from people not finishing degrees, from people losing jobs, from people closing businesses and restaurants. Um, all of this is, you know, usually you, you throw a pebble in a pond and see the waves rip out. Here, this time we threw a huge boulder in a pond. So the ripples are going to be uh, bigger and longer felt. Would there, in your mind, be any opportunity uh, with with these things coming to, you know, Hoppe talked about buying up public assets and public government buildings with with a financial collapse if that were to happen is there some kind of silver lining to that where where you could almost see privatized communities at all do you see that as a possibility well you know i'm not sure if crime keeps spiraling i think you're going to see a lot more of what we might call private communities um, no, no question about that. And that, that's an uncomfortable truth is that crime rose, especially in cities, uh, unbelievably in 2020 relative to, you know, previous years where it had actually been on the decline. So that's, that's kind of an unhappy, uh, you know, another, uh, unseen statistic from the COVID year is, is criminality. And a lot of that just comes from, of course, boredom and, uh, <laughs> people being idle. So that, I think that was to be expected. Um, you know, there's going to be all kinds of opportunities. I think a lot of people will get very, very rich in the 2020s, just like the 1920s, because I think it'll be a hugely speculative mm-hmm. decade. I think people who figure out how to hedge or outpace inflation uh, w- will get rich. I think people who figure out a lot of techie things, which were already you know happening before COVID, will get rich. But what, I guess what bothers me about it is that, you know, there'll be so many brilliant people spending all their time trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, game capital markets, Mm -hmm. as opposed to actually trying, you know, using their brain power to spend all their time trying to figure out how to be bring a better good or service to the rest of us. So that's, you know, that's, I, I don't like that. I know that it's, it's a little bit of a left wing trope to talk about the financialization of the economy, but there's a hell of a lot of truth to it. You know, a lot of people, I think, absent the Fed, uh, would have to do jobs other than what they do, moving money, uh, as opposed to producing a good or service. So, uh, I, I think I think there's going to be a lot of new, new really rich people because there's there's a lot of opportunity now for for the gig economy, uh, for uh, you know work from home arrangements and what that's going to mean. Uh, you know, we we we've seen companies like Zoom come from relative obscurity to become the number one dominant uh, video platform in, in less than a year, in a few months. I mean, I'm sure fortunes were made. I, I'm, I forget offhand who owns Zoom. But, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's always opportunity, and we ought to get after it and not complain, I mean, first and foremost. Do you think, uh, I want to ask you something about time preference, because Hoppe talks about that a lot, and I, I love this subject. I know it sounds obscure and, and strange to a lot of people, but do you think the left having a very high time preference, does that have to do, or excuse me, does them winning everything, does that have to do with, with a time preference issue in your mind versus libertarians with almost zero time preference or those on the right with very low time preference? Do you think that comes in to play as far as the mm. structures of power go and, and the left seemingly winning all the time? Well, in a sense, um, you got to hand it to the left. They've, in, in, in a certain sense of the of the term, they've had low time preference because they've been willing to have big victories slowly. Yeah, you know, over decades and decades, and maybe even beyond their lifetimes, rather than a, you know s- small victories here and now. I mean, the the right tends to sell out its interests, such as they are, pretty cheap. Um, you know, there there are lots of people. There are architects of like Social Security, for example, which was, you know, it, obviously at the time, and it still is today, but at the time, that was a deeply left wing idea that people would simply get paid a retirement income from Uncle Sam, uh, and that a certain amount would be forced out of their paycheck every month to pay for this program. I mean, that was a pretty radical left wing idea. 
And so the people who engineered that when life expectancy was well below 65, by the way, and there were something like, you know, 30 workers to every one social security recipient, the people who engineered that are long gone. They're, they're dead and buried, but yet they did something that lasted and is going to mm-hmm. cause us tremendous problems, by the way, uh, you know, well beyond their lifetime. So I, you know, I'd like to see us have that same degree of, um, I, I guess, of faith in what we're doing to, to say, hey, you know, some of these things that we're working on may not bear fruit now, but maybe they will beyond our lifetimes. And I think that's a, a good way to live in general. Yeah. So same here. It, when it comes to understanding structures of power or possibly how to make some positive change, what frustrates you most uh, with libertarians as far as actually trying to achieve some of these things or working in a productive manner in the right direction? What frustrates you with, with libertarians in that manner? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I guess first and foremost, it would be the universalism, this idea that we need to have the same political structure everywhere. Uh, in order for liberty to win. I I think real liberty is allowing people to have as much say over their lives as possible. And while I would prefer no government whatsoever, if we're going to have it, I would prefer it be as local as possible because I feel like as an average person, I have a lot more ability to control or, or influence local politics than I do you know, regional or state or national or God help us international. So I think that's, that's first and foremost, that liberty is letting other people live as they see fit so that you might live as you see fit and letting other people live involves things that, you know, may seem illiberal to you as a libertarian. So that's the, you know, first and foremost is that, uh, uh, decentralization and liberalism and tolerance have a price. They have a heavy price. That means you have to leave other people alone even when you don't like what they do. Okay, that, so that's, that's first and foremost. But also this tired, uh, neither left nor right thing. I mean, look, th- we live in a progressive America and that doesn't necessarily just mean left progressive. There are certainly right progressives, people who believe that the state ought to be the centralized, central organizing principle. Uh, and that through statecraft, all things are possible. You can command economies. You can command a certain type of government in Afghanistan. You can just will these things. To me, that's what a progressive is, someone who thinks you can use government force to basically will things into existence. And so there's people on the right who fit that description as, as, as well as people on the left. But I mean, progressives control government and, and don't kid yourself, even in these red states, they, you know, go to the cities, go look at the city councils, go to the school boards. You'll find, you'll find progressives everywhere. Uh, they control obviously corporate America. They control media. They control the arts. They control K through 12 and secondary education. Uh, they're, they're increasingly starting to control the military and, mm-hmm. um, and they certainly control, uh, mainline religion, you know, Protestant, uh, churches, Roman Catholic church, most synagogues. So, th- you know, this is just a reality. And when you're talking about illiberalism, you know, you, you tend to think about this in just such uh, binary left, right terms, when in fact, um, it's progressives who run everything. And if you can't admit that, or you're too hung up on being neither left nor right, or, you know, if you, if you can't accept that, you're just useless because that, that's the reality. So if you're not willing to start from reality, you know, you're one of Murray Rothbard's space cadets. Yes, uh, the modal libertarians. Uh, do you think there's an issue maybe, and, and feel free to say no, but this is something I've been trying to, to put together in my mind and talk to people in our circles about, but with libertarians, Maybe they should try to be better people. Maybe they should try to gain more wealth. Maybe they should try to look more presentable. Um, And I say this because I I feel like sometimes the ordinary person that's just looking for security and safety from from elected officials may not want to hear the message uh, if it's coming from someone that would seem like an unimpressive kind of weirdo to them quoting just abstract theories. Do you, do you think that we can work in that area as well? Well, of course. I mean, this, this is how progressives win is because they have wealthy, successful people on their side. 
right? Um, that that's obvious. And so, even if you're you have a minority perspective on, a, let's say, a particular issue, um, it doesn't matter if you have elites pushing it for you. There's often a way to get it done, whether that's not electoral or you know whether you do it through the courts, whether you do it through media, whether you do it through. Uh, social pressure or corporate pressure or however you do it. So this is this is um, cl- clearly a place where, you know, it just makes sense if you think about it. If if people who are really wealthy and successful, almost by definition, have some degree of interest and in, vested interest in the status quo, right? O- almost by definition, if you're wealthy and successful, you don't want to completely upset the apple cart. And oftentimes, wealthy and successful progressives are all for, you know, new taxes and that sort of thing, because they'll still be wealthy. They'll still be elite. And this represents sort of a, I mean, first of all, it allows them to scratch their guilt. And, you know, and second of all, it it allows them to basically enact barriers to other people joining them amongst the ranks of the wealthy and elite. So, um, you know, I think, I think, uh, being an impressive person is pretty rare. And, and I'd like to see impressive people running for office in, you know, in third parties or, or whatever. I, I don't think we need, you know, it, well, I always hear this thing like, well, we have these great ideas. It's like ideas. Okay. I mean, you know, when Microsoft developed Windows back in the 90s or whatever, there were a million companies, in, small companies in garages who had a better product than Windows. They're still... Uh, uh, tech guys and programmers who bitch about Windows and bitch about Microsoft and say, oh my gosh, it's a totally inferior product, you know. But but Microsoft won. Microsoft had sales and marketing. Um, and so this idea that the, the best ideas will will win out, I think that's that's a pretty dangerous mentality. That's that's not a very smart way of looking at history or politics. That's the, that's not how things normally work. I, I always uh you know have a little pause when I see someone say the marketplace of ideas. I mean, you know, like there's no weight on the scale there. Give me a break. I mean, it's not like, um, kids are assigned Hoppe just like they're assigned, uh, Rousseau, right? I mean, the, the, the thumbs on the scale. So we have to be a little more gorilla in our thinking. And I think that starts with, you know, getting some elite people interested people who have enough money and power in society that they're they're willing to take a risk and go out on a limb and um you know and uh, do something for for liberty a lot of people in our circles uh, look at you as 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 a type of leader i mean you are the president of the mises institute and that's looked highly upon by many of us what would i i guess we're you know wrapping here shortly what if you could just give any advice or get anything off your chest to people listening that, that you wish would get out there uh, louder, what would that be? Wow. Well, that's, that's another tough question. I mean, I guess first and foremost, it's just, um, you, you have to save yourself before you save anybody else. And so you have to hopefully, you know, have, have your act together, your finances together, your life together, um, and, and, you know, may, if, if possible, be working towards a family and if not, uh, be working towards adoption or being a great uncle or aunt or, or whatever that might be. Cause I think that's so important. Um, you know, we, we tend to forget about kids in this whole equation and we tend to forget about the next generation and the left's done a great job of super woke all these, uh, you know, 20 somethings. And so now, you know, young kids, uh, grade school kids are being taught by, you know, super woke teachers who are, you know, basically inculcating them with, with left progressivism. And so we, we haven't done a very good job of uh, fighting back against that. So I think we, you know, we can all do a little bit of that, I think in our personal lives. And books, uh, you, you host one of my favorite podcasts, the human action podcast, where you guys always go over uh, books, some, some short, some, some deep and long, Uh, give some book recommendations to my listeners. Oh man. Um, well, there's, there's a lot of great stuff out there, right? Right now I'm reading a book called class by Paul Fussell. Uh, it's about class divisions in America written in the eighties, but still really good. Uh, that, that's a fantastic book. We're about to start on my show. We're about to start delving into Murray Rothbard's big two volume history of economic thought. So that's going to be, uh, multiple episodes. And, uh, you know, the, the easiest and best way to learn economics is to read the history of economics and to read biographies 
of economists. As far as I'm concerned, that's a lot easier than reading Man, Economy, and State or Human Action. You know, go read The Last Night of Liberalism by, uh, by Guido Holzman, of course, and um, you know, you'll, you'll, learn, you'll learn plenty of economics along the way. So I, I, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible that one of the last things Rothbard finished were these, two, or, what, or actually didn't finish the second volume, but these two huge volumes of the history of economic thought. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I'm just hoping that people tune in. And, and uh, you know, if you don't want to read the books in question, then we're sort of giving you the cliff notes. In, in the uh, speech we talked about earlier from Hoppe, What Must Be Done, he talked about anti-intellectual intellectual, intellectual uh, uh, institutes, which obviously you guys are at the Mises Institute. And you have an event coming up in October. Can you talk about that? I, I really want to get out there and I'm working on that now. Talk about what you guys are doing out there and, and what's going on. Oh, well, we have a, we do a bunch of annual events, but this is our, this is kind of our social event. It's more of a supporter summit. So we get together with a lot of our donors and we have a couple of days, usually at some nice resort. This time we're in St. Petersburg, Florida. And the, the whole weekend's going to be uh, based on strategy and, and what should be done and revisiting Hoppe's essay. So we're going to have a bunch of great speakers like Tom Woods, uh, talk, giving us their perspective on, you know, sort of where, where we are right now in America and where we're headed and what we ought to be doing along the way. Awesome. And plug away for any social media presence you want to give and, and the Institute uh, websites, uh, Twitter, any of that. Well, I, I hope you're checking out Mises.org. I hope you will go there and sign up for some of our daily emails. And I hope you're following the Mises Institute on Twitter. That's the best way to just sort of get our scrolling feed of articles and also following me on Twitter at Jeff Deist, one word. Excellent. Jeff Deist, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you for being here once again. All right. Thank you, Buck. Yes, sir. All right. Once again, thanks to the great Jeff Deist for coming on this show. And like I said, some of you will want to watch that interview. I know that it's on our YouTube page, Counterflow with Buck Johnson. Go to the YouTube page, subscribe to it, comment away if that's what you like to do on there. I do see most of the comments, I, I think. So uh, give us some love on there. Share that around. We've got the counterflowpodcast.com website, of course, where all of my social media links are, all of these episodes are, and it's even got a link to my Patreon if you want to uh, donate some money this way. All of it, of course, goes right back into the show. That I can promise you. It's also got uh, the Counterflow t-shirts on that website if you'd like to look cool while you're listening to something so cool, right? So that's counterflowpodcast.com. Go to iTunes, leave us a review if that's the kind of thing you do. I should start reading some of those. In fact, I will do that. That's, that's, that's my word. I'll start reading some of those reviews because I'll read the good ones and the bad ones. The good ones, are, of course, are nice to read. The bad ones crack me up sometimes, so maybe they'll crack you up too. Telegram group, if you got that app, we got a Telegram chat, Counterflow with Buck Johnson. All kinds of great stuff in there. My man Bruce is in there. Mark Metz in there. Becky, lots of good people in the Telegram group. Shout out to all of you guys. Articles shared on a daily basis and lots of back and forth good discussion in the Telegram group. And until next week, you guys have an excellent week. Hope you enjoyed this chat and we'll see you soon. You get split in fucking half. The hologram graph, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. This has been the Counterflow podcast, a part of the Renegade Media Network.